Great. So it's lovely to have Rabbi Wayland with us as part of our Lunch and Learn session, or bring your own Lunch and Learn. And uh, he is speaking now about circles and lines, egalitarianism in the mystics in the book of Bamidbar. Yes, so hopefully that uh, title isn't too, um, too ambitious or too off-putting either way. Uh, Pils, please feel free to interject um, at any time. Um, so this is something that I've, I've been thinking about, I had a bit of fun with, but sort of hopefully we can uh, draw some from it as well. So um, I have to confess, I'm not a, uh, I, by, by day, um, I'm a maths teacher, so art doesn't nat come naturally to me. Um, but the themes of geometry made me do a little bit. Um, I want to start off, as I often do, by looking at a couple of pictures. And really what we're going to use these to do um, is to, to frame kind of the Bamidba journey, the whole journey that the Jews are going through in the desert. Um, so I suppose taking a step you know, backwards, we are... Um, we're towards the end of the year. we've had um, a bunch of different rebellions. We've had the rebellion of Korach, uh, we've had the sin of the spies, um, we've had the uh, the whole incident at the end of uh, last week's partial with the, uh, the uh, Jews sinning with the daughters uh, with the daughters of Midian and, and that whole that whole thing. And looming in the background is something that doesn't actually appear in the book of uh, in the book of the Midbar and the but appears in, um, appears a couple of um, several parishes. Text the uh, the last Shabbos before lockdown, um, which was the uh, the sin of the golden calf. We owe them so much. Sorry, I've just muted someone. Hi. Power. It's going to be interesting when you go, but when I go, so go back to sort of real life and, you know, people actually interrupt and you can't just, you know, press the magic button. Um, <laughs> um, so, as I was saying, um, that, the, the, the event of the golden calf really frames um, the rest of the Torah from, from that point onwards. Um, so, and, and, and the book of the Midbar, the book of Numbers, is really kind of where all of the action is oh, yeah. All of the anxiety um, of, you know, leaving Egypt, all of the um, you know, fear of the future, it all really comes to place and we see that in many, many different ways. Um, so, that, that's the broader context. Um, the other context that I want to think about um, is the I suppose the festive context that we are now in. Um, tomorrow we are going to be commemorating the fast of Tammuz, um, the 17th of Tammuz, which um, I suppose most recently um, uh, recalls the um, it's the, 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 the breaching of the walls of Jerusalem in the first and the second uh, temple times, um, you know, several other events as well, but in its inception, the 17th of Tammuz is the is the is the the memory is, is the golden calf. Um, three weeks later, um, we're going to have Tishabav. So Tishabav is, of course, the destruction of the temples. But going back in time, um, it's the sin of the spies. So really, these three weeks we find ourselves in are, um, you know, the story of the Jews in the desert. You know, it's the start. It's the uh, the breakdown of the golden calf. And then it's the culmination of the sin of the spies and sort of when we go through the three weeks, when we go through that time period, um, we are we are reliving that experience. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think the first of Av is the yacht site of Aaron, I think. Rabbi Lawrence, does that ring any bells? So the first of so the first of Av is the is the yacht site of Aaron. So he died in Parish's Courthouse last week, so again, sort of another um, important things to bear in mind, when one that doesn't sort of obviously feature, um, you know, as a day of mourning per se. So let's have a look at this. Um, this is a, this is a, uh, I mean, Jan Lincoln, from a brief look at him, this uh, piece of art. I mean, he was an illustrator and an engraver. So this is the start, this is his uh, diagram of the Jews in the desert. Um, very schematic, you know, and this really sort of 
the reason why I liked this is that when we open up the book of numbers, when we open up the book of the Midbar, um, once we get past the initial numbers, the thing that really strikes us is that as we read through it, there is so much detail about the encampments. Um, you know, I love his, I love the straight lines over here, you know, the fact that you've got the grids, um, you know, each sort of tribe is divided into, into grids. I'm not quite sure where that comes from. Um, I don't, I don't know the colours, I don't know if there's any significance to the colours over here. Um, but very ordered, you know, and when we read the book, we get that impression, um, you know, because we've got the numbers of this one, the numbers of this family, um, their leader is this, and then it's, and then it's, um, and then, and then it's repeated, and then we get, you know, the, the, the tribe of Yehuda is camping over here, and the tribe of Shimon is camping over there. Very regimented, very, very ordered. Um, and it's, uh, the, 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 the start of the Midbar very much gives that impression, very, um, very clean, uh, very methodical. Um, which lasts for a couple of weeks till it all begins to break down, which is why I kind of uh, wanted to, to pick up on this. So we've got the order over here of the encampments in the desert. Um, but, um, by the way, does anyone have any primary Does anyone have any comments on this on this piece? It's quite hard. I didn't. I couldn't really find any. Uh, there's not very much on uh, you know works of art to do with the encampments in the desert. I'm, I mean, again, I'm not a sort of Oh, it's a historian, but I couldn't find it. Um, any, any, any thoughts or comments on this? Again, feel free. These are uh, uh, feel free to uh, to, to uh, you know, comment or interject at any times. So, sorry, can I? Sorry, may I ask? And yeah, sure. um, the the picture at the bottom, the people. What do they represent? I have no idea. I was, <laughs> um, That's okay. Yeah, I, I mean, is it, I mean, it's obviously, maybe it's sort of the non-Jews around sort of looking in awe. I, I, okay, that's fine, no pressure, I just thought you uh, yeah. might have known. No, I, I was wondering that myself before. Um, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go down. This one might be more well known, and I'm sure the artist is more well known to, to, to many of us. And this is obviously Chagas. Um, this is sorry. Let's try and get this in. Um, so this is one of Chagas. Um, so have a look at this. This is um, the golden calf. Um, yeah, again, I'm not an expert in Chagall. Um, you know, I think the contrast between different colours is one of you know his, is is one of the things that he does a huge amount. Um, obviously, we've got Moses on the right hand side um, coming down from the mountain. Interestingly, his dark uh, have uh, very heads. Um, up there and up there, um, but you know he's he's in he's in the dark. The mountain is gloomy. The mountain is dark, um, and then obviously he's coming down to the left to face the crowds that are da dancing around the uh, the golden. I can try and work out where the police car is. See who hears it next. Um, so the reason why I like this as a contrast is that although there's obviously uh, it's a lot more chaotic as is one of his pictures but I, you've definitely got the feeling of, of circles over here um, you've got the deep red sun over the actual uh, age. it's not very golden this uh, nothing is golden here it's all it's all sort of deep red I don't know if that's uh, darkness of Moses it doesn't look like a blood color per se um, but then as you go down you've got sort of these circles um, sort of you know some concentric circles dancing around you know the, 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 the angel I mean there's some free dancers there and there but you've got this whole sense of the chaos of the um, of the eagle uh, the chaos of the golden calf with everyone dancing in circles around um, Golden calf compared to the uh, sort of orderly, the orderly lines, the uh, sort of geometric precision of the um, 
uh, of the encampments. So that's kind of the, 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 the context that I wanted to, to set up initially. Um, you know, just down here. I don't know if this is, I couldn't, so by, I, I only found this on one website. This wasn't clear if this was a Rembrandt or a student, um, just from the details on the websites. Um, kind of looks Rembrandt-y. Um, so, you know, over here in the background, you've got the much more orderly circles. It's a much more ordered uh, piece than, than Chagall, obviously. Um, <laughs> you know, given, given time periods and the stars and so forth. You know, you've got, I'm not quite sure who the people at the front assume that's meant to be the leaders you know, discussing or debating how to deal with the, uh, the inception, the, 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 uh, the, um, the revolt that, that has emerged on the right hand, on the left hand side. But over here, you definitely get sort of the geometric, you know, the circular impression around the, uh, um, around the, the angle. Um, and I think also as well, you kind of see almost um, here you've got the mountain looming in the background, which um, is a contrast to the sort of tree that the, uh, that the figures on the right hand side are, are sort of cowering underneath or discussing. Um, and, you know, the other, the other big theme as well over here is that, you know, the, the Jewish people, they were initially around the mountain and then very soon they stopped being around, around the mountain, around the you know, Horus Sinai, and then instead uh, they're dancing around the eagle. Um, so you've got this, this sort of contrast of the roundness around the mountain, which is sort of looming in the background, which is where the Jewish people were meant to be surrounding, but instead they've replaced it with, with the golden calf as well, and that's what they're now circling. Um, again, um, if anyone has any comments on either of these, uh, again, Shigala, I'm sure people have, you know, know far more about Shigala and his works than, than I do. Um, it's a very evocative piece with the contrast between the between the dark colours and the background and the, sort of the regimus of the, uh, the sun and the uh, calf. Yeah. Anyway, just a, so that's the, that's, that's the setup over here. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on from, from the pretty pictures, from the, from the paintings. Um, again, please feel free, questions, comment. Um, so, right. As follows. Now, the reason why it's sort of the, the, the whole background over here is I, I, I became intrigued with, um, you know, I'm studying various um, Kabbalistic, you know, and mystical tracks over recent uh, over recent years. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm a member of that circle by any stretch of the imagination, but there's a huge amount of symbolism um, in Kabbalistic works, um, and um, you know, some of the most most famous ones, sort of the, the tree of the Rizal. Um, is a very famous symbol in Kabbalah, and that's probably the most famous one with the ten spherots, the ten emanations um, coming down. Um, I want to, uh, I, I found something sort of reasonably recently um, that sort of struck me, and it struck me with the sort of full experience in the desert, which is why I'm you know, sharing it with, with, with everyone today. So as follows, um, by the way, is anyone you may have heard of Arya Kaplan, Rabbi Arya Kaplan. Anyone, anyone come across him? He's a very, very, he, he was he's a very, very well known uh, writer and thinker. Um, he was American. He um, died in 1982. Um, and he was, um, originally, he was a physicist. And then he went into, um, he, he was a, worked as a rabbi in some, several small out of town communities. And then eventually ended up in New York and ended up translating a huge number of works and wrote some very, very influential um, sort of booklets um, that I'm sure you've got in the, the Shul Library. And he wrote an excellent translation of the Humash um, called The Living Terror, um, which is surprisingly not very well used, but it's incredibly readable and it has a huge amount of, um, sort of um, information about the real era. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there we go. From uh, from my I've got mine. Mine is over there. Mine mine is slightly more faded, uh, for various reasons. Um, he also um, there's a series called Ma'am Loes, which is um, an 18th century, I think. It's a translation of an 18th century collection of midrashim, halacha, um, um, which you know, the, it's dozens of it's dozens of volumes. He translated it. Um, but he also translated a lot of Kabbalistic works as well. Um, 
And so this is one I want to show you over here. Um, he was he's very interesting. He's got he's got a few books on meditation on on, on, on Kabbalah and Torah and meditation. Um, he seems to have been a uh, uh, want. He himself didn't sort of engage in meditation as a as a Kabbalistic practice, but seemed to have guided a lot of people um, in that regard. There was actually a letter by apparently the Lubavitcher Rebbe um, at one point wrote a letter um, against his. Uh, against Larry Kaplan, not directly, but in sort of his approach to, uh, to meditation. Anyway, that's a discussion for another time. Um, so let's have a look at this, okay? So um, I'm, going to, I'm going to sort of read this in a second, but just a bit of background. One of the most um, important features of Kabbalah, so Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, um, it's the Arizal, from the 16th century, who was the turn of the 16th century in Safat. So he was um, possibly one of the most influential Jewish mystics, you know, past, you know, past millennia. Um, he uh, sort of revolutionized or sort of, uh, revolution isn't quite the right word. Um, he had a very prominent school of mystics um, in Safat. Um, I'm sure some of you have been to, you know, been to Spot and sort of seen his mikvah, seen his, seen his shul. Um, he changed the way that um, Judaism looked at the sort of mysticism um, through his students and his, the writings of his students. Um, you know, mysticism started to come through to the to, to the mainstream of Jewish consciousness. Um, you know, most prominently through the Hasidim in the in the 17th, in the 17th 18th centuries onwards. Um, but one of the most important principles of Kabbalah, of Jewish mysticism, is that of um, what's known as simtsim. Word you might have heard, um, and it means God's process of hiding himself, because um, Jewish mysticism, is, I mean, all mysticism is very, very bothered by the big question. How can we have a world where God seems to not be present? If God is infinite, God is everywhere. And God is all-powerful, God is all-knowing, um, how can it be that our, we, we, there's a perception that God isn't here, um, which we all feel and, you know, all acutely aware of? And this is the, the question, how can you have an infinite God? Um, and if God is infinite, we should be able to feel God, we should be able to see God, we should be able to, you know, live in God's presence, um, but we, that's not our lived reality. And the process by which God concealed himself is known as Simpson. Um, so I'm going to, to read it, and obviously this matches very, very uh, closely with the creation process and, and every good mystic will read the opening lines of Breshet in, in, in this regard. So, so the Arizal the says as follows, so the four things were created. The supernal light was simple. It filled all existence. There was no empty space, which would be space, emptiness or void. Everything was filled with the simple, with the simple or with the light of Ainsof. Ainsof is another word for God, and it means uh, the, the, the one without end. There was no category of beginning and no category of end. Um, time was not yet a, a, a construct. Um, all was one simple, undifferentiated, infinite light. Um, so when it arose in his simple will to create all universes, every one of these words is laden with, with meaning. They're not sort of by chance. And um, so he constricted, and uh, that's the word Simpson. So he constricted his infinite light, distancing it to the sides around the center point, leaving a vacated space in the middle of the light of Ainsoff. This was perfectly spherical. Okay, so amazingly, it's a very, very geometric construction over here. Um, but you've got Hashem, and then you've got, he constricted the light, and it's almost like the layers of an onion, um, and sort of, it was, this space is perfectly spherical, and obviously that's the space where we find ourselves. After this constriction took place, there was a place in which all things could be brought into existence, created, formed, and completed. So after this space was formed, there was a gap, um, this gap is absolutely terrifying. We might come back to that a bit later, but it was filled through sort of a four-stage four stage process. Um, I mean, you know, you could change some of these names and it would almost read like a sort of physics textbook, um, sort of the process of the Big Bang. 
and this is the line that I love, we then drew a simple concentrated ray from the infinite light into the vacated space. So we've got the sphere, I'm like doing it with my fingers, but I'm a bit scared, so this is kind of anthropomorphic. Um, so if you drew a single concentrated ray, the upper extremity of this ray touched the infinite light of the Ainsoff that surrounded the space and extended down to its center. It was through this ray serving as a conduit. The light of Ainsoff, the light of God, was brought down to spread through the, in, this entire vacated space. Uh, I mean, this is just absolutely loaded. I mean, just, you know, the, the, the symbolism here is so rich and every single one of these, you know, words almost has a book written on it. So again, this is sort of the key teaching of the Uriesel, Uriesel from which everything else flows is that you had this idea that God was everywhere. He sucked him, you know, he created this void, he created this space. Um, and then in that space, you know, there was nothingness, but sort of a lying as it were, came in and then filled the, that space with, with, with divine light, as it were. Um, so that's the process of, of God's creating the world. Um, this is like a very loaded line. Any, any, any questions or comments on this? This is just this is so much in here. Okay. Um, so, um, I really should have put some of the original Hebrew in here. Um, okay, so, so the reason why, okay, so let's connect this to, to the desert, okay? Um, the desert, I think, in many ways is this void. Um, and really, we've got this interplay over here of, of what's known as a gulim, of circles, of spheres, um, and lines. Um, so you've got the space where we are all present, um, which is this spherical space that God made a, a space for us to exist. At the same time, the world is sustained through this you know, line of infinity coming into it. Um, so I want to share a couple of sources which just kind of put this into the desert experience. Um, so a couple of, number one, okay, I don't have time to go through all of these. I've put a lot in, but you know, it's just you know, um, a lot of it is for further research. So this is from Ravi Yitzhak Mira Morgenstein. Has anyone, come, anyone heard, come across him? So Rav Morgenstein actually is, um, he's from London. Um, he went to, he grew up in Golders Green. Um, he went to Pardes um, and he um, is a, a Kabbalist now living in Yerushalayim. Um, he, I mean, his most remarkable um, you know, Rav that I've come across in a very long time. Um, he, there's a letter written by a, a Rav of his when he was, um, must have been about 11, he was on a he was in a camp in America and so there was a letter to his parents which is available, you can find it, I might have um, find it on Twitter, Rabbi Lawrence, see if you can find it on Twitter. Um, a letter about Rav, Rav Morgenstein. Um, so he, um, and, and in this letter, he just writes about how um, the rabbi of, 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 of the young Yitzhak Mir writes about how you know he you know he was clearly sort of gifted from a very very young age and was going to for, forge a new path. Um, he now has a yeshiva in, in Yerushalayim, um, which has a school of students surrounding him. Um, this is from a weekly email that he puts out. He his students put out. Um, it's, it was a hundred pages of like dense words of teachings and you know they put out a yearbook which is which is about a thousand pages each year it's just incredible he seems to touch on um, such a vast range of Torah sources um, and what he does is he will take everything and sort of link it together with all areas of mysticism um, and out of all uh, rabbis that I've come across, he sort of tries to link in in a, an incredibly fundamental way, um, you know, all Jewish thinkers and how sort of they all form uh, sort of different facets. Um, I, I mean, he's quite remarkable, and he'll quote in here, you know, sort of how he, uh, you know, he heard this teaching from this rabbi in London, and he, uh, uh, you know, this is his his uh, his, his development of that. Um, so, ah, oh my gosh, okay, I'm just trying to work out how I can put all of this in. Um, 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 um. So as follows, um, he, so this is his reading of the Korach story. So it's in Hebrew, I'm going to have time to translate it. 
So the, so the current story from a couple of weeks ago um, was as follows, that, um, you know, we, there's this rebellion, um, you know, the Jewish people realize they're in the long haul, they're in the desert, so long haul. Korach gathers together 200 different people, 250 different people, and, and, and basically lays this claim to Moses and to Aaron, like, you know, that you have taken leadership for yourself, you've taken the high priesthood for yourself, and um, Korach's key claim was that the entire people are holy. Um, Korach said to Moshe that, you know, you've taken it for yourself, you know, there's some severe nepotism going on here, and everyone needs a chance. Um, obviously, you know, we, we know the story. Korach's claim was very, very enticing. People joined in. They died in various manners. Um, you know, most famously, Korach and his supporters were swallowed up by the earth. Um, the problem that Rob Morgenstein deals with, which is really what everyone tries to deal with, is that um, Korach deal, is dealing with the, um, I suppose, the animal farm problem. Yeah, those of you have uh, you know, read Anim Animal Farm, um, you know, that some, uh, was it? Oh, what's the phrase? All animals are created equal, uh, but some are more equal than others. Um, so, so that's really the, sort of the, 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 the problem with Karach. How could it be that, you know, he's claiming on the one hand that everyone is entitled to equal holiness? But at the same time, it was evident that he was the one who claimed to be more holy than others. Right, so how could that possibly be? Right. And that's the paradox of, of, of Korah. And it was a very enticing one. Um, I don't want to name names, but there are, you know, there are definitely politicians who um, use that line today. You know, that um, everyone's created equal, everyone deserves an equal chance, um, but I'm more, uh, you know, but I'm the one to lead you. And again, so it's, it's a paradox. And, and how does it work? So Rav, Morgan Stephen says something amazing. So he goes back over here to one precise line. Um, this is full of very, very difficult Kabbalistic terminology. Um, so he 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 are, he's dealing with this problem. Um, and he says that normally um, Moses was a was a leader who was a leader in, in the form of a line, right? Because you've got, you've got this line of holiness. Um, and Moses was a was one who kind of assumed that um, you know, not assumed that Moses was the conduit to Hashem, that's clear in the Torah, and God spoke to Moses, Moses related, conveyed the teachings to, to Hashem. Um, so Moses was in this, this form of a line, right, that he was this sort of communication that, that God created the space and Moses was the line into the space. Um, so Karach said, you know what, actually, in a way that I'm on a level where I can see that instead of being a line, that all of the people right, are, on, are on an equal level, right? That I can see that um, there is a point at which where everyone becomes equal. Normally, in order to have access to Hashem, right, it has to go through Moses, but can I have said, you know what, that I'm above everything, um, and because of that, I can see that everything becomes equal. So, um, I mean, he deals with it in terms of very, very difficult Kamsic terminology. Shusham had been there, he began at Orat Ha'agulim. Right, the Karach was on the level where everything was round, was, was this circular ideal that equated everything. Um, so Moses' response to Karach was that he bowed himself down, he prostrated himself. Moses says, do you know what, Karach, you, you think you're so holy that you can see that everyone's equal and that there's no differentiation. Moses response to Korach was that he bowed down. Right? By bowing down, Moses said, you know, I can go to the, to, to, to the very, very bottom. Um, and this was kind of almost the, the, the meta argument between Korach and between Moses. Um, that Korach said that I can see that everyone in their, in, in their essence is equal, that we have this idea of a circle um, and that's got the gap inside the circle. They're not the gap, they're the circle itself. Um, and Moses says, in, 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 by bowing down, by prostrating himself, he says that you may be right in theory, but in practice, um, you know, we need to have kind of this, this, this very great, this is variated experience. Um, so that's kind of his take on the Karach story. And he phrases it in terms of this lines and, um, and circles. Okay, is any, um, any, any questions on this? I realise that, that this is loaded with different terminology, so I might have uh, 
might have needed some a bit more explanation somewhere. Is that okay? Can I move? Can I, can I press on a little bit? I can see some nodding heads. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. I can see nodding. Yeah, thank you. Okay, fine. So that's that's number one. Um, just trying to keep an eye on the time. Okay. Um, okay. I'm just going to skip a couple of different. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just skipping of some of these for purposes of time. Um, so this is this is great. Okay, this is um, by the Ma'or of a Shemesh, a very very classic Kabbalistic text, um, sort of early 18th century. I think. Um, so he's 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 de he's dealing with a completely different part of the Torah. Um, so he says as follows: That's when the Jewish people left the desert. Um, so when they left Egypt, sorry, um, they came to the Dead Sea. We crossed the Dead Sea. We sang a song. Um, famous Az Yashir that we read in Parshas, um, that we read in Parshas Peshalach with the song of the sea, we read it on the Sunday day of Pesach, um, and it concludes, although we read the whole song at the very, very end, um, it concludes with Miriam the prophetess. And Miriam the prophetess takes the women um, and they sing the song. Um, but there's a, quite a critical difference that in a way that he deals with um, between the way that the women sing and the way that the men sing, um, which is that the women sing with instruments that when they get to the, uh, when it, it gets to their song, the Torah says that they take, that the titsa, so this is what here, that the women take their, their chukim, their drums, and their mcholot, uh, which is another type of drum instrument, I think. I think it's normally translated as cymbals and drums. Um, so although the song of the sea was sung by men, it was subsequently sung by the, by the women, but they used instruments. Um, and I think, I think, with the introduction, you can probably almost see where this is, this is going. Um, so he asks, what's the, uh, um, you know, what's the extra lesson in the fact that they brought the drums? Um, and he says, he picks up on the word mocholot. Okay, I'm going to focus on this. So the word mocholot, drums, symbols, however it's translated. Um, Maybe Rabbi Lawrence can look in his uh, living tower to tell us how Rabbi Kaplan translates it. Um, but it's based on a, the, the, the Hebrew word mochol um, shares a root with the word mochol, which is a circle. Okay, you can see that over there, the, 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 the four letters, it's the word mochol. Um, and that's, you know, obviously comes from its shape, um, the drums, the cymbals being round. Um, but there's something as well, which is also um, really important in the Hebrew that we're going to pick up in a minute, which is the word mechol, not only means circle, um, but it's also related to the word mechila, which means forgiveness. The word mechila, which means forgiveness. Um, so he says as follows, he says that, um, so we want to, uh, so the yesh didactic ma bolesh menim so we need to sort of be precise. What is the Torah coming to teach us that the women left and they prepared and they went out uh, and they went out? And also, what's this word, mocholot? Okay, it appears to be extra. Um, and the Torah doesn't miss anything out. Um, and we can also um, be precise. The Torah is also written in the future as well. Okay, so three questions he deals with. Um, we're not going to deal with all of them. Um, so his answer is as follows. It says that it appears that we're going, we're going to draw a hint to this and what's this written in the future. So it's an amazing Gemara, we'll see it in a second, um, that the reason why the women went out with these symbols is to make a hint to in the future, God is going to make a circle for Siddiquim and he's going to sit in the middle of it. Um, so I'm going to now zip on a little bit because I need to uh, just realize the, the time. Um, so this is a very, very famous Gemara in Tana. So it's the, the, the Masechta as a whole it deals with the fasts. And then at the very, very end, it deals with the celebration that comes at the very end of the fasts, um, which is Tuba Av. So that's going to be the uh, Tuesday or so after Tisha B'Av. And um, there's a mini fast day, which is known as um, the, the Tuba Av, and it's described in this Gemara. Um, but the amazing things over here is it says that on this day, um, you can't see it in English, the daughters of Jerusalem would go out and dance in the vineyards. Um, in the Hebrew, it's the word cholot, 
um, is the word for dancing, which is the same word as circle, you know, dance in a circle. Um, but it's also the same word as forgiveness as well. Um, and the teaching that the previous one was referring to is over here that at some point in the future, in the end of days, God is going to arrange a dance for the righteous. Um, again, that word, mohol, circle, he's going to arrange this, the righteous in a circle, and he's going to be sitting among them in the Garden of Egypt, in Eden, and everyone's going to point towards God and say, this is the God who we waited for. Um, now, over here, this is where it gets, I think the symbolism is absolutely amazing. So what we've got over here is the reason why the women then took out the symbols is because it was to hint to this, the symbols around, um, but it's also the same words over here as the circle of the righteous. And at some point in the future, God is going to arrange this circle where everyone's going to be equal. Um, and I think over here, there's a message, there's a, there's a word over here, I've just noticed that. Um, so it says at the end that um, this is our God who we waited for. He might say this, this is God who we waited, who we waited for. Now, um, this is a passage from Isaiah, Isaiah speaking about the days of the Mashiach. Um, the word for hope in Hebrew um, is the word kav. Kavayel Hashem. It's the word for, 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 for line as well. This is absolutely amazing. Um, that, again, the word for hope in Hebrew, so the, this, this verse of God, um, about everyone hoping for God, um, is the same word as line. Um, so if we go back to the initial you know, symbolism, the initial Arizal, we've got this whole idea of the vacated circle. Um, and that space is kind of where we exist. That's sort of the chaotic space of the Jews in the desert. Um, you know, it's the space where God is dark, where God, is, yeah, sorry, no, where God is not immediately present. It seems to be dark. We don't know what's going on. Um, but there's a ray of light which shines into this circle. Um, and over here, you've got this in this one passage. You've got the juxtaposition of those two things. You've got the circle of the righteous surrounding God. Um, everyone is sitting around God, and it's sort of, it's, although it says the righteous, it seems to be clear that everyone is included in that. Um, everyone is, rather than being in, this, in the vacated space, they're now the boundaries for the space. And at the same time, you've got this whole idea of hoping for Hashem. And that hoping for Hashem is that line. Um, so I've just realized that there's a, you know, going back to our initial you know, vision of the desert. Um, maybe here going back to these two pictures. Um, you know, the, the, the desert is the transition time in, in, for the Jewish people. It's the time where, um, you know, they left the mountain and God wasn't present and they felt themselves inside that void. You know, it might have been very, very initially structured. You know, again, you can see over here the lines, you can see over here the order of everything, the ordinance of everything. But very quickly, once you feel you're inside the space, what happens is you lose that connection, you, you lose that line, and um, you know, as it were, you lose that line to God. Um, and the result of losing that line is that that you know we end up with the circles, we end up with the circles of the angle, we end up with Karach insisting that everyone is on the same level. Um, you know that, and once you lose your your line, as it were, you know. There is a bid for egalitarianism. There is a bid for everyone being equal. That's not inherently a bad thing. But what happens is without that connection, without that line to Hashem, as it were, we see the experiences of the desert where we have one thing after another. Um, and the Jewish people losing faith, losing sense of faith in themselves, losing faith in Moses, losing faith in God. Um, and that's the chaos of the desert experience. Um, just to go back to this last teaching so this is the last time we teaching which again i've only just noticed the, the juxtaposition over here um that you know we do hope for a future where we can be in the circle where we can rather than being inside the space we can be around the space um the solution is almost the line you know realizing that we do have this like some very very thin line this very very thin ray of light that connects us to god and that very thin line connects us to God as the one which sustains us when we're inside the uh, more terrifying uh, wilderness of the, of, of, of the halal, of the gap inside. So again, that's a, uh, um, 
I'm sorry if I've had to cut this slightly shorter than I would have liked, so I need to go and uh, pick up my children in a minute. But that's kind of my my Kabbalistic insight or sort of um, my understanding of the Kabbalists and sort of how they might approach the chaos of, of the desert. Um, so, yeah, if anyone's got any questions or comments, please feel free. Um, again, this is my understanding of some of the symbolism and very keen to hear some of you. I can't hear you, Mr. Abelis. No, no. It's all right. I know, okay, so. Yeah. Any thoughts, comments, questions? Again, this is my interpretation, so feel free to disagree with any or every, everything. Um, obviously, you sort of didn't pick up on the egalitarianism aspect that much. Um, but, you know, there's a lot to be said on that. Um, um, apropos, of, apropos of Korach, um, the underlying, the, or as I get the underlying message, although it doesn't say so, is that really he thought he should be the, uh, the king, the emperor. After all, he was uh, a cousin, was he not, to Moshe? It was. He was a cousin, yes. It was. And probably older than him, I don't know about that. Probably not older, but he thought that he was more qualified. And that was the underlying thing, saying we're all the same, um, so why should you be in charge? Let's have a democratic vote, and uh, I'd like to be the head. But he didn't want a democratic I, that, That's always the message that I get whenever I read Carla. Yeah. That really, uh, you know, yeah, all that about being, um, you know, all holy and all that, there's a load of, uh, just, just, it sounded very nice, you know, I'm as good as anybody else, and since I'm as good as anybody else, and uh, I'm quite a, you know, a good chap, um, I think I should have ch a chance of being the leader. And the, the, uh, thing, the, the thing is, though, is that he, he didn't believe in Demar, he said that he should be the leader. Yes. That's the problem, that's the paradox, is that, you know, we should be democratic, but I should be the, uh, I should be the leader. I should be the leader, yes, we're, we're all democratic, but really, uh, or we, we should have a vote, and uh, I think I'm, on, I'm the best man, really. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, well, what's so special about you? But he didn't say that the, the whole thing is fine, we're all holy, um, but he didn't sort of carry on saying, and I'm particularly well equipped to, uh, to lead because A, B, C, and D. You know, mm. he didn't really spell that out, but uh, that was his underlying. I always take that as the underlying, and all those 250 that joined him, you know, they thought, well, look, let, let, let us take, uh, after all, we've got a big, uh, big community where we're leading it, and, um, uh, you know, we want to be the machas. Yeah, but as I said, I think that's really the, the paradox of dealing with leadership versus, you know, the egalitarian. You should, it's one or the other. Um, and I think that's the, the paradox of Kurt and the beauty of the story over there. Can you see me? Can I, I ask think... a question? Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. I can't hear. Okay, so thank you very much, first of all. It's really interesting, very complex. And obviously, as a mathematician, you're probably very interested in circles and lines. Um, so how would you say an ordinary Jewish person um, should really interpret the circle, the circle and um, the line that goes to Hashem, the line of light? Um, as, 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 so I think it's really this last idea over here. I think um, that well, when, you, when you find yourself in that space where it's, you know, you can't see God, you can't see um, it's things aren't clear inside the space where you see the divine presence, you might not know in which direction to turn. Um, today, we don't necessarily have leaders like Moses, um, you know, and I think that's sort of one of, of today very much so is that we, you know, we, we find ourselves wandering around in a circle and can't can't find our way out. Um, but the line of that is... I can't hear him. Can't hear him. Um, 
I can, I can hear you. I can you not hear me anymore? Not very well. It's okay. <laughs> Could hear you now. Yeah. Um. I think it's. I think the idea is that. Picture. Um. Our faith is that line. Um. You know, it's this word. Um. Hope. Is that that. Um, we are. You know, we hope that God will rectify the situation. We hope that God has a plan. We hope that um, all of the mitzvahs and good deeds we do go somewhere. And that hope is the same as that line. And I think really that's kind of the, 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 the and thank you for, for, for prompting me to articulate it, um, the hope. Um, the, you know, the more that that line becomes tangible. Um, you know, there is that line there, sustaining creation, and it's there the whole time. Um, but we can make that line more present. And the way that we do that is through our, you know, our faith and our hope, as it were. Thank I'll, you. If that answers your question. And I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah, and thank you for you know, getting me to articulate it, hopefully a bit more clearly. <laughs> thank you. Just I, want to say, sorry, I just want to say my whole in Hebrew, it's a dance. It's you dance around like a horror. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dance in a circle. In a circle, like a yeah. horror. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. All of these, all these words are, are related, and the symbolism is just like yeah. so. So, so talking about a circle to carry on with the symbolism. So the women chose a circular instrument. Usually, it's translated as a tambourine. Yeah. to dance uh, and to express their joy and to express their thanks whilst the men just stood there. So what is the message? Because I often find that rabbis don't emphasize this very much. So what do you think is the message of that, those two sentences in the Torah where it tells us out of the blue exactly what Miriam and the women did? So I think very, I think very, uh, this is sort of what uh, no, actually as Rav, Rav Epstein says, he says that the women were expressing much more clearly that hope. Um, and the men were singing, um, but the, the future was much more manifest. Um, there, there is a book, um, and I mean, I have to go in a minute, I'm afraid, but there is a book by Miriam, I think her name is Miriam Cosman, um, and she writes about, I think it's called a circle and an arrow and a, and a line, actually, I think. Um, and um, I mean, she's speaking about orthodox feminism. Um, she actually lives in the Maybach, um, but she brings a lot of these ideas out that, that sort of, the, you know, that, um, you know, the faith of the women in the future is, you know, is leading to sort of a greater, you know, egalitarianism. I and mean, she's writing from a very orthodox perspective. But just to, you know, one line out there, that, that it was the expression of their faith. Um, much more than see in many, many examples in the Torah, including the daughters of Slavchad in this week's parasha. Um, yeah. I'm afraid I really have to go now because I need to go and pick up. Thank you.